the important um, festivals are are the major ones. Uh, Holly Shorts, because you know, obviously it's a qualifying and it's a good festival. Uh, Sundance or or Cannes or Berlin, the big ones. If you're there, that's awesome because then I can, if, if it works out and I get to a place where I'm trying to sell you a, an agent or a studio or a producer, they're not going to respond to, you know, uh, it's not to say they're bad, but they're not going to respond to the, you know, the Cape Cod Film Festival. It's just, it, you know, when you see a lot of those laurels, it, it's, it's very nice, it's exciting, and it's, you know, congratulations, but in trying to sell yourself, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, unfortunately, interest a lot of people. Definitely. And, and I told you I'd be kind of I, I, brutal I want, and honest. I want you to be honest. I mean, again, this is, this is coming straight from the horse's mouth. So, um, one thing I do, you know, you obviously like to jack ass as well. Um, <laughs> um, and the, the other thing, too, is that, you know, you do represent actors, and obviously actors have to get from the casting directors all the time. Do you have some advice for the actors here on approach and, and building up those types of relationships? And, yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, everyone, uh, you know, the the legitimate uh, projects are, are are coming through on on Actors Access, and, and of course, we have it on our Breakdown Services, and every actor gets access to those, even though they're not supposed to. I don't know how they get them, and that's fine. But it's really, you know, kind of goes back to the old school way of sending your your material to them. Uh, on your own if you don't have representation. It, it, they're, they're totally fine with that because they have to find the next thing or they have to fill uh, a role that maybe they're having a heck of a hard time finding with their representatives. That have so the, the way of doing it is sending their the headshot and, and the resume that's stapled on the back and probably a link with uh, your, your demo reel, gone are the days of, of CDs prior to that VHS. Um, but, you know, it, 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 casting directors still welcome that because they're always, always looking and, uh, again, even that is uh, a simple letter to go with that as far as, you know, I've studied here and uh, these are my most uh, recent things. And when I get those queries, I don't, uh, I don't do anything, I don't represent commercial um, at all. I, I don't try to get people commercial work, it's a totally different thing. So a lot of times people will say, oh, I booked these five commercials. It's not, it's different because it's not theatrical acting. So I don't need to know that you're in a separate commercial. I also think there's something about, you know, being gracious in your feet. And what I mean by that is, if you, you know, this is a, this is a business of no, right? We're all taking our no's, but we're searching for that one yes. And it's always what you learn from the no's, I think, that separate the, you know, the people that end up being successful. What do they take away from the no? Um, part of taking away from, you know, what you can take away from the no is to be gracious and defeat. And that means that you're very thankful for the person who read it, even if they said not for me. Uh, you know, can I submit something to you the next time? Is this an open door? Um, on the acting side, you know, I've heard casting directors, I mean, everybody's different, every person is different, but I've heard casting directors say that, you know, a handwritten note, you know, thanking you, thanking them for, you know, seeing the actor or the actress goes a long way and makes them go, well, you know, maybe if something else comes up, I'll, you know, I'll remember that person. These things go a long way. I mean, I, when I first started, I somehow, in my first script, got the attention of, of, of a pretty big producer and he read the script and he wrote me back and he said it's not for me. I didn't know what the hell that was. You know, so I pressed and I said, you know, well, can you give me, you know, a couple of pieces of advice or a couple of things that you didn't like about it? And he just wrote back and said it wasn't for me. And I wrote back again and I said, don't you know, I'm just asking. You know, the Brooklyn guy yeah. came out in you yeah. like... <laughs> yeah, I'm like, no, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. Uh, but I, you know, so finally he actually said, he gave me his number. He said, call me at the office. And I called him and he said, how long have you been doing this? I said, well, I've been producing for a long time. Because when you have a script that you don't like when you, you know, when you're producing, like, what are you doing? I just say, well, you know, we, I, sometimes I don't respond. He goes, well, he goes, it's one way of doing it. He goes, my response is almost like not responding. He goes, but I want to be nice enough to, you know, give you something. Because when somebody says it's not for them, he goes, nobody in this town is going to tell you why. He goes, nobody is going to burn a bridge. He goes, I may end up working with you in a few years. 
goes and goes. And if I do, he goes, I might be brutally honest then, but you know, right now, this is what I have to tell you. He goes, having said that, he gave me a few pieces of advice about the script. He goes, because you were persistent. But it, but it was a lesson, right? And it was something that I, I learned from that, you know? And he also said to me, he goes, this email that you sent me originally, he goes, you're probably going to have about a one in 1,000 success rate with that letter. It just so happened that I'm in between projects. It goes, and my wife's about to give birth, and I have nothing to do. So I figured, what the hell? You know, so it was, it was a lesson. But, you know, again, be gracious in the feed. Always be nice to people. And, you know, be thankful and grateful for anything anybody does for you. And make them remember you. You know, give them a reason to remember you. The handwritten note thing is, is really good. After every uh, meeting I have with someone in this industry that, I, that I've never met, if it's a first general meeting with the studio or network person, uh, executive, I send a, a, a handwritten thank you. Uh, I don't write it. There's, you can go online and there's a service that you pay and you write it in there and then they print it to make it look like it's handwriting. Uh, there's no one here to take away that. Uh, but, uh, and, and, and nine times out of ten they respond uh, back in an email uh, saying thank you for your card, it was very nice, and, and hopefully they were not, and again, it builds a, a relationship. I don't, it's the easiest three dollars that, you know, makes it look like you're a nice guy. <laughs> and you know, in part of all of this that we're talking about, you know, as you were talking about an actor, you become a brand. As you were talking about writing, you become a brand. As you're a filmmaker, you, you become a brand as a, you know, as a creative. So I wanted to talk a little bit about crowdsourcing, which is not crowdfunding. Um, and actually, R.P. wrote a book uh, for the American film market called Crowdsourcing for Filmmakers. Um, and when we do the Q&A, we're going to give this out um, to the best question that's asked. Um, can you talk a little bit about crowdsourcing and what it's like to build a brand um, as a career baby? Yeah, I think for filmmakers, when you're starting out, I think that, you know, it's really the brand of your film before it's the brand of you, right? Especially if you're raising money, you're trying to crowdfund, um, which is different than crowdsourcing. Uh, crowdfunding, obviously, everybody in here knows what that is. Crowdsourcing really is about identifying and engaging, and uh, identifying, and engaging, and moving the crowd on behalf of you and your brand. Okay, well, the brand of your projects, the brand of your, your material, and then eventually the brand of you. But the brand of the film comes first. The brand of your writing comes first. Like, what do you, you know? What what do you want your brand to be? What do you want to be known for? And this plays a big part into your networking as well, in my opinion, because your brand online stays with you. Um, I'll tell a really quick story on the acting side. Recently, just to give you an idea, recently I was asked by a friend of mine to come into uh, the audition room to watch two actresses audition because the whole room was split on these two actresses. He just said to me, he goes, Arby, he goes, we're, we're torn. He goes, we have such different takes on the character but they're both amazing like they're just amazing and i was like I, you know i don't want to make the decision <laughs> I'll, I'll watch them the first girl came out the first actress came out and she was dynamite and i just sat there and i was like how could the second one possibly be any better and then she came in and did a completely different thing on it and i was blown away and i said i'm afraid i'm not going to be any i can't help it i mean this is unbelievable i hate to be in the shoes and one of the casting directors, at one point, everybody was just kind of sitting there moaning about And she goes, have we ever looked at what they do? Have we looked at their social media? And not for the numbers, not for the number of followers, which happens in this business, unfortunately, but, um, but for the way they carry themselves. And so she did, and we were all just kind of sitting around, and all of a sudden she went, oh, oh God. And the one actress was wall-to-wall -wall politics, and ranting and FUs and you know, like that, you know, that. And the other one was literally always talking about the craft of the business and helping people, like, you know, going like to hashtag auditions and saying, like, it's okay, you know, you had a bad audition, but this is what you should do and learn it. The decision was made right there because they were like, she's going to be, she could be difficult. Maybe she hadn't shown that in the audition, but she had shown that online. So her brand online was. Somebody that was going to be a pain in the ass, and somebody that might be a little combative, and maybe somebody that would work well with the director or wouldn't take direction. And the other one came across as totally collaborative and totally in it, and that was her brand. So a lot of it is, you know, what do you want the brand of your film to be? What do you want the brand of your projects to be? What do you want the brand of your writing to be? But then what do you want the brand of you to be? Um, and then how do you cultivate that? And you know, how do you get people behind that? You crowdfund something, for example. 
most people fail with crowdfunding because they don't identify. They, you know, you ask them, "Who is this film for? Who is this project for?" And they go, "Everybody." And God knows that there's never been a film that everybody has agreed on, or agreed upon. You know, they, they, your favorite film, you'll find the track. You know, like, the people that succeed in crowdfunding know this is the subject matter of the film. These are the sub, you know, sub audiences for this film. People who like this, people who, you know, it's maybe it's a female audience. Maybe there's a character that has autism, so we're going to go to, you know, autism communities, and we're going to, you know, do we get that? We're going to engage them. Do we get this right? Let me show you the script. Let me show you what we're doing here. Are the things that we're not getting right? They give them ownership. They get them involved. And then when you push that button on that campaign, it's like you, you know, if you've done this for a few months, everybody runs in, right? They're in on the brand of your film at that point. Now, if you deliver everything you say you're going to deliver, you stay on top of it. You give. You keep communicating. Even after you wrap, you don't let them go disappear. You, you stay with them. You let them know where the film's playing, what they're doing, showing them behind the scenes stuff and everything. Guess what they become a fan of? The brand of you. Because now you've proven yourself as a filmmaker. You've proven yourself as a writer. You've proven yourself as an actor. Whatever it is. You've proven yourself, and now they'll come with you forever, as long as you keep delivering. So that's really what it's all about. Again, it's all about building that brand. It's all about building that audience. And it's a long game. Again, this doesn't happen overnight. It's it, Think about your best friendships that you have in this world. They're all based, right, on trust, and probably based on a lot of selflessness, too. It's no different in this business, and it's no different when you're trying to build a brand for who you are, what you're trying to do, and you know what you're trying to accomplish as a career. So, just things to keep in mind. And don't be weird. <laughs> you can be weird, but target other weird people. Yeah, I, I, I want to open it up for questions, but before I do, RB, I want, um, in the book, you I, I think this is important for everybody to know, um, you talk about the rule of three. And RB puts a lot of examples like this um, in the book that are just, just really great to take away as a filmmaker. So can you talk about the rule of three? Yeah, I mean, everything is, again, everything comes from a place of selflessness. If you're, you know, people say I have no place on social media, for example, right? I always say the easiest, if you're an introvert, the easiest path in on social media is to share content that, you know, you, you guys all, I don't care how introverted you are, you guys are doing research, you're looking at things, you're reading articles, if there's something cool that you like, share it, make sure you hashtag it so other people can see it, okay? Be complimentary when other people post things. Don't just go, oh, here's a cool link, and then you read it, and, you know, that's it. No, thank them or ask them why this was interesting. Them. Ask questions of other people. Ask questions. Maybe, you know, not everybody, you're not going to get a response 100% of the time, but you'll be astonished how often you will, even from people that you think are unapproachable, okay? I've seen people like, you know, Aronofsky and, and Mark Romanek, you know, just get so engaged with people that are, you know, either posting great content or asking them really thoughtful questions, you know? You see it all the time. So those are ways in. But the rule of three is simply this. Give of yourself three times before you ever ask for anything. Offer something three times. Offer, oh God, I can't believe that. We've gotten this far into this and I've never used this word. Offer value. Everything is about what value are you bringing to every single engagement, okay? And that, by the way, that's the same thing even with query letters and stuff like that. What value are you bringing to this thing? What, what, besides, just read this for me, like, you know, what other value are you bringing? That's important. You know, it's so important. And it's so important when it comes to building relationships, especially online. What is, what is the value that you're bringing to that other person? Sometimes it's just a freaking comment or, or appreciation. It really is. That's sometimes for the value that people need. I put this up, you're grateful for it, awesome. What do you do? You know, I mean, when you keep giving and giving and giving, what's the natural thing that somebody's going to say to you? Tell me about you. Okay? But that's very different than me, than you walking up to somebody and go, let me tell you about me. You know? It's very different. All right. Let's uh, take some, uh, we'll take some time to get to some questions. Anybody have any questions for me? So, um, other than having uh, being engaged in uh, social media and using Stage 32 as a platform, um, what are some uh, networking events that you would recommend in terms of building a relationship in order to get uh, in? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll repeat it just so everybody can hear it. So he said, other than online networking and platform like 
Stage 32, what are some other events that you would recommend to, uh, to network? I just recently saw this uh, thing online. I think it was emailed to me. Meetup? Is that a, is that a, like, yeah. And I thought, I, why well, I don't, I don't know. You sound like an old man. <laughs> Was that on that interwebs then? That was on the interwebs. Uh, I didn't know. I didn't know. Did you go to Alta Vista? Yeah. Well, my prodigy wasn't working. Uh, anyways, this thing called Meetup. Uh, meet uh, and so I looked into it and I thought, oh, this is great. Why? I wish this was around in 2000 when I was trying to do this, which, you know, Alta Vista didn't have it then. Uh, and so I kept looking and I thought, oh, well, some of these are probably going to be good and some are probably bad. But I thought that was a, a pretty neat thing, and, and there were quite a few uh, decent ones on there. So I thought, and I told a couple of writers that I represent, take a look, and you know you can meet other writers this way. I think it's good to, to not only network with uh, producers or studio people or uh, people that are legitimate, but network with other other writers and, and read their stuff, have them read yours, and um, so I thought that was a pretty neat uh, place to, to do it. Now I'm really going to blow you mind. Within stage 32, there was a thing called stage 32 meetups. Never mind. There you go. Now, anybody can start a stage 32 meetup. By the way, no matter where you live in the world, you could set up a meetup and, and other, meet other people. You know, have other people RSVP in your uh, you know your neighborhood, your town, your city. Um, the bigger question, I mean, in LA, I mean, realistically, you could be out every night. I mean, there is an event every night. I mean, if you do some searching, there is something every night. The bigger question really becomes. Is that valuable? You know what I mean? Is it valuable to, is it just action and motion or is there stuff happening, really? What's the best use of your time? And sometimes I have to be honest, there are times where there are events where I will sit there and go, is it worth me going 40 minutes in the car one way, 40 minutes in the car the other way? Or would I rather spend two hours online tonight trying to really target what I'm looking to accomplish right now? You know, it's great to have those relationships face to face, of course. And I'm not saying you should never do it, you should, but pick and choose your spots because sometimes it'd be better or you might be better off home writing or editing or you know, setting up your next project or doing whatever the heck you're doing. It, it's, it's, it's quality over quantity in my opinion. And it takes a lot of discipline because there is that this thing called FOMO. <laughs> Fear of missing out. Yeah, FOMO. Um, kids call that FOMO. Um, and there is that to it. Get hip to it? Okay. Um, so there is that. And, it, and it's, you know, it's natural because every look, we're all anxious, right? We want to go, we want to go, we're all anxious. And I get that. Um, but sometimes, like I said, sometimes it's too much motion, too much action, and not enough depth to what, you know, it, not enough targeting to what we really need, you know, at the end of the day. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to piggyback on that because a lot of those things, there are probably. Um, if, let's say if there's uh, 50 people at this uh, networking thing, uh, probably 47 are there to network and, and meet people, and the other uh, three are, are um, the people that you want to meet with. So uh, in this town, uh, you're just going to run into people saying, oh, I'm doing this, and I'm doing that, and by the way, they're all full of shit because they're not doing that because they're, they're just not doing that. Well, you know, that's actually going back, I just want to tie that into approach really quick. Really, you know, if you've been around the business for a long time and you guys are doing this right now, you know within two seconds of talking to somebody whether they're really serious or not. I mean, you really do, okay? And sometimes that's just in a simple email or sometimes it's just in a DM or a post. I, somebody said yesterday that uh, they, oh, maybe I saw this on Twitter, I saw, I saw this somewhere, that somebody, um, a manager said, what, like, why do you, he said something like, I'm a part-time writer. And she said, well, I'm a full-time manager. Why would I want to be in business with you? And she didn't mean it like part-time, like I'm working, you know, she was just like, she basically was telegraphing the fact that, yeah, you know, I'm gonna take a shot at this. You know, you want to rep me? I wrote something and she was like, no, I'm sorry. That's not the way it works. So everything is about, you know, how you approach it. You can tell within two seconds, really. And then two, you know, the, the I can't agree with what RV says more. Uh, with Stage 32, we, we run contests for our filmmakers as well as our screenwriters within the community. And what we do is then we match our winner with the 
proper executives or producers or people who their material makes sense. And the one thing that we always, always, always teach our winners are you do not go in there talking about anything but your filmmaking. Or you do not go in there talking about anything about your about anything but your writing because that is what the person on the other end of the table wants to hear. And if they like you and they engage with you and if they hire you and if they can get you work then you're probably going to have to drop your regular 9 to 5 job because they want you to be doing that 24-7. Um, and then I did it. I, I agree, and, and I'll tell you, every time I meet someone, uh, if it's an hour meeting, probably 45 minutes is of me wanting to get to know them. It goes back to the original point that they talk about that. But you're actually right. They're going to want to know that you're going to drop what you're doing. Case in point, I, I staff two uh, writers on uh, uh, animated series, and one had a full-time job as a teacher. And when I called them, I said, you're going to have to quit your job. And she said, no problem. Like, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Definitely. Um, and I did also just want to piggyback on the meetup question. Um, we're actually, anything that Stage 32 does, chances are it's usually filled with education like this. So we announce all of our events on our blog. So make sure you're reading our blog every day. Check out our meetup section every day. Um, we actually have a, uh, an executive meetup coming up in two, three weeks here in Hollywood. So if you guys are here, um, we're bringing in a manager to talk to the writers about uh, you know, just taking questions so you can find that in the meetup section. And then for more specifics, I also recommend, um, obviously, Holly Shorts is a great film festival. Um, if you're a writer, the Austin Film Festival is tremendous networking. Um, there's the Flyaway Film Festival in Wisconsin that is an incredible networking. And you can make your way out to CAM. Um, I know it's a long shot, but the, the networking community at CAM is just incredible. So there's some, some definitely great places to, um, to check. Um, all right, any other questions? Sir? Hi, um, we've discussed uh, a bunch about online interaction and query letters and things like that. And I'd like to maybe ask about in terms of direct contact, physical, you know, actual in the room contact, the balance between confidence and humility and vulnerability. Do you find there's value in all three of those? And how would you balance that out as you're looking at somebody, interacting with somebody? Are those three elements, things that, that resonate with you, and in what way? Yeah, I, 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 that was great, actually. I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal that, uh, because, it, yeah, the, the material is probably what got you in the room, and at that point, you're selling yourself. And if you are, uh, you know, that humility comes out, that, you know, you're not, uh, you know, a lot of people think they're the greatest writer, and, and who knows if they are or not, but uh, if you come off as, as that kind of arrogance of you are, I should have been in here 15 years ago, then you should have been in here 15 years ago, but uh, that's a great combination of, of three things to have because uh, it tells me that when you, if I do work with you and, and send you into meetings, that you're going to be just fine. Uh, because those meetings are not just about the, the material, because I've already given it to that person to look at, and they're there now wanting to meet with you. If you're doing the same thing that you did with me, and you're just, all those three things are, are included, uh, then you're gonna go far. And I've had people tell me, great material, but just, they're not great in a room. And, and that makes a difference. If you can accept the fact that, you know, accepting defeat or whatever, you know, I might even bring in a person for a meeting if I didn't respond to their material, because, just the emails back and forth made me think, well, maybe this person is, is worth meeting. And if you come in there and, you know, it kind of goes, my uncle told me you teach when you talk and you learn when you listen. If you're willing to just listen uh, and, and, and hopefully be educated and learn one little thing from me, uh, you're going you're gonna to be all right. You have to be open to, to uh, you know, you're trying to, it's a job interview at the end of the day. You know, you're just trying to, to get your foot in the door and uh, you're, it goes back to that personality. If you're, a, you know, you, if, you're, if you seem like you want to learn uh, more and more, uh, that's all that matters to me. Uh, yeah, I, I can't add much to that. I think when you, when you have accomplishments and, and accomplishments that matter, and again, we talked earlier, you know, if you're winning Joe's screenwriting contest, that's not something you want to lead with. But if you have accomplishments, there is a certain amount of ego that should go with that. And I think that there is a certain amount of, you know, pride that should go with that. It's just, again, it's knowing your audience, really. It's knowing who you're talking to. And 
thinking about like again I like I, I went into a, a, a meeting recently on the studio lot and I went in and I it, it hit me when I was in the waiting room that this meeting was so exciting to me and I was so amped up for it but this was one of like 20 meetings that the person I was about to meet with was taking that day and because I looked around I saw other people sitting around waiting to meet other executives and I went okay you know, I'm prepared, I'm ready, I'm, I'm, I am going to go in and talk about, you know, the, good, the cool things that have happened with this material and, and again, what value I could bring. But it made me even more aware of that I wanted the first five minutes of that meeting to be all about the person I was meeting with. And I was prepared to give that. And that worked because it became sort of like, and, and again, sometimes it's, why did you decide to make this project? And don't pick the most popular one. Or why did you decide to work with this actor? Or how did that come to be? There's an insightfulness to this. Or you read something in the trades and it's like, hey, I saw that this one. Congratulations, that's really cool. How'd that come to be? Now they know that you're really serious because you're reading the trades and you're aware. I mean, all those things matter. And then, and then you know, then they're ready for you to kind of bring that ego in because that's what got you in the room in the first place. You wouldn't be in, you wouldn't be getting that meeting at that level um, if that wasn't the case. You know, Here, here's a little uh, trick that I even do in, in looking at the trades. If I see someone get promoted from assistant to like a creative executive. I email them and tell them congratulations. And then they say, uh, thank you so much. And then I say, we should uh, grab coffee sometime. And they say, would love to. And then next thing you know, you know, just because I'm in doesn't mean I know everyone and I don't, but that's how I, so if you do, it works. Uh, and if you invite me to have donuts, then it even works even better. But, you know, the good thing is, is that uh, it's a, you're establishing a relationship based on uh, not asking them to do anything for you. You're saying congratulations on, on your promotion. Even if it's to a vice president or director or EVP position, you're congratulating them and hoping in the end, and, and of course it's, it's, you're also being selfish, you're hoping that they respond uh, and, and want to know uh, who you are. And that level is the right level because they need to build their network as well. And they need, they are constantly reading. So if you fall in there and they respond, that's your golden ticket to at some point say, hopefully someday I can send you something to read um, and good luck with everything. And nine times out of 10, they're gonna say, of, of course, yes, I'd love to. And ask, ask them to have a meeting, that way you can, can get on the lot, because it's, to me, even though when, every time I go to Warner Brothers, studio, any studio, I'm giddy because, oh my God, this is what we do for a living. And I, man, I could not agree with all of that. I, and same thing, I'll send emails, this is what I was saying earlier too about learning from every no or, or using every no to your advantage. Keep a list of people that said no and if they're in the trades and something could happen to them, send them an email. You know, and just say, hey, great stuff. It may not ever, it, you know, it's, it's even just showing, if, even if there isn't an agenda, even if it's not to get in a meeting, even if it's just to show that you're a very nice person and that it, it goes a long way because you never know when that person might say, hey, I know this person, I know this. It matters in this business, it really does. It's a small community. Uh, in a lot of ways, a lot of people know each other, people switch jobs constantly, so they end up working with people that they were acquaintances with, acquaintances with, but now they get to know, and it just carries and it carries and it carries, so it's just, again, that's just an awareness thing, you know what I mean, in a lot of ways. I, I, got an, I sent an email to an exec that got promoted, six months later she was somewhere else, she didn't respond to my congratulatory email, but then when she moved to another studio, she my email was in her email and she gave me her contact, I wrote back immediately and said, congrats, uh, we should get coffee again, never had coffee, but she doesn't remember that. <laughs> And um, one quick thing to that too, you know, just so you guys uh, all know, I think a lot of people think that, you know, once you do get representation, that all of a sudden, like, your job stops and your rep's going to do everything for you. And let's say that you do have a development executive that is interested in the film or in the material, that, um, you know, your, your work is done. It's not. And, you know, you constantly still need to be networking. And your development executive or your producer or, you know, um, your creative executive, they're constantly networking as well. I mean, it never stops. There's never a magic moment where it all just stops. Your liver gets shot. But here's, <laughs> a, here's, a, here's a tip. If you invite someone to drinks, uh, get their drink 
and then go take it to them and then get uh, something dark like a Coke or something and get them shit-faced and get them to say, oh yeah, I'm very happy to read your stuff, but you're sober. And, and they're not. It works. <laughs> all right. Um, if we have time for one more question, because we're going to wrap it up. Okay, all right. So the question was, at what point in your career as a writer or a director, or a writer-director, uh, should you look for representation? Uh, have more than three uh, features, if that's what you want to do. Uh, you know, the idea of writing a, a, a speck of, of, of blackish, you know, years ago that's the thing everyone said, you got to have a, a speck of an existing show. Eh, you don't, I mean, you, you really, in my opinion, you don't, even if you're trying to get your staff, which is a whole other conversation. But I hope that you have more than, than one screenplay, and, and preferably two of different, even genres. Uh, again, that goes into your branding, that you may only do romantic comedy, you may only do horror. If you say you only do romantic comedy and uh, science fiction, I'd be impressed. Um, but, you know, have two or three, preferably screenplays, if you're doing people. And, and have a television, uh, even if you're not wanting. Because at this point in the game, it's the Wild West, and you should really have everything. Um, have a couple few of those uh, samples. you got to have your toolkit. Um, no, you know, be sure that you can positively say I, you know, have two or three people that I've, I've come to know and that that's in the business at, at whatever level, if it's an assistant or whatever, um, and and know what a manager or an agent does. Uh, typically, people go after both, uh, and they really uh, should go after the agent uh, as much as they should go after the manager, and uh, and and be prepared to. Uh, ask the manager what uh, they could probably do for them if, if, if you're uh, ready at that. If you feel confident in yourself, uh, and again, that'll show in that room, if I think you're ready at that point, it doesn't mean I wouldn't sign you, it just means that that's another thing I'm gonna work with you on. Uh, and, and that's something I work with some of my clients on is, is being ready to win. Because you've got the talent, but you're not quite there ready to, to go into a room and have those meetings that people remember you by. Yeah, I mean, for me, I didn't even think about it until I had four features. Um, and that was part of that was because I knew one wasn't great. Uh, and I also knew that I was going to be asked, what else do you have? Because you always are. And for most managers, the reason, you know, look, there is the rare occasion where somebody has that one great story in them and they just freaking knock it out of the park with their first script. It's rare, but it does happen. But for a manager, you know, it was like what David said to me, because I want to be involved in this project, but I don't know if I want to be involved with you, because he said straight out, he goes, I don't know if you're a one-trip pony. And that's the big fear with a lot of people, you know, a lot of managers, that, you know, I, I'm gonna get in with you on this one thing, and then what, the, you know, the well goes dry after that. So most people are gonna want to see a few samples, you know. Um, I did not, I didn't, at the time, I didn't have a TV sample, but TV also wasn't blowing up the way it is now. Um, so I, I totally agree with that on that. I think that, you know, it's good to have something, even if it's a half hour comedy or something, or, you know, just, just so you can show that you could write the medium, you know. Um, if you're really against that, if you really just want to write features, I mean, that's fine. And if you're in one genre, that's fine. Um, but you're going to want to be able to explain that and articulate why you're doing that in a room. And it might, you know, it might, let me just, I had a, a manager one time say to me, and I just why I turned it down. She said, I, I'm trying to figure out where you fit in my roster because she was so about, I have a comedy yeah, writer, this, I have yeah. this writer. I was, I was like, this is insane. You know, that goes back to Nick's point too about you know, interviewing your, you know, they work for you. A lot of people forget that. A lot of people think, you know, you work for them and could be further from the truth and that's when it gets all upside down. Um, so you got it, you know, once you do get to that point where you're going out there, uh, don't jump at the very first person and don't, you know, make sure you're getting references and make sure you're asking all the right questions. How do you see my career? Where do you see me going? What do you see? You know, are you in love? You fell in love with the script. This is in this genre. I may not want to write in that genre all the time. Is this where you're going to put me? All those things matter. Um, and sometimes it's not obvious when you're on, when you only have two writing samples. So, you know, that's where the communication is. It, and it's touched on something, uh, you know, if you, if you, uh, if I know that 
you you want to what you want to do if you want to just be a, a feature writer. Uh, if I know that going into the meeting, that's great. But if a lot of times we're looking for people that uh, you know, I'll meet with people and they'll say, "Oh no, I, I don't want to be a staff writer," and that's. Uh, you know, a lot of my business would be that. And if, so if you don't, if, if you thought, no, I could never, I don't want to do that, that person might not want to work with you. Uh, and I'm not saying that's for everyone. For me particularly, is if you don't want to, um, I, I had to drop a client because he was also a substitute teacher. And uh, I you know, he could have gotten, I think, a staff job. And he said, well, I've got a great thing. And I thought, Okay, well, you don't know if you could have gotten that job, and if you're not willing to leave something else for that, just like the other teacher said, yes, I'm, I'm quitting tomorrow. Fuck this kid. Does anybody here have kids? Good. Uh, don't come no, up to it. Don't, <laughs> don't come up to this. They're afterwards. good for ideas, actually. Two are terrible. Yeah. Wrap it up. Yeah. Um, and, and then also. However, if you have pictures of your salads, feel free. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it will just uh, also tomorrow. Um, it's not in the, in the program, but we are doing a panel at 11 a.m. and it's going to be about the distribution landscape for short film. Um, for some, it was a typo, so we're actually going to be talking about that um, because a lot of times, as a filmmaker, with just dis getting distribution for your film, loss it will often lead to opportunities for representation. Um, so we'll be talking about that tomorrow at 11, and then tomorrow afternoon at 1, we're, we're, I'm bringing in a few panelists who have uh, developed shorts as proof of concept. And one of the guys actually does not have a manager or an agent, and he has such a game about his career, even without one. And so uh, I, I brought him in so you guys can learn the jobs that he's done. So that might be okay. And you'll always be, let me just say this, you'll always be your own best advocate for anything. No matter who reps you, no matter, you're always going to be the person on the front line. And that's, again, why it's so important that you're very, very aware of everything and, and mostly how you're presenting yourself. It really, really does matter. So you're always going to be carrying that gun on the front line. And, and really, I think I kind of said it, but it's important. Know why you want uh, a manager. A manager, unlike an agent, you know, I, I, I sell stuff, uh, but that's their job. And when you're ready, it's great. But if you don't know why you need a manager, if you think you, if you're trying to get a manager just so you can sell things, you're not quite ready to have a manager. You haven't figured out what our data, data is. All right, well, we're going to be getting ready here for our next panel at 1 o'clock. But before, if we, it's women in entertainment. We have a really, really... Oh, they can wait. <laughs> there, we have a really, really kick-ass panel, so I hope you guys stick around for it. But we do also have a giveaway, so you guys have to decide what was the best question. That's on you, Nick. I can't. I can't. This is, I'm going to have to take the fall for this one. Ah, wow. congratulations. But the book is available on. The book is available on Amazon. Crowdsourcing for filmmakers, indie film, and the power of the crowd. 63 reviews. I think 59 of them are five star. I did get a one star review that said, if you like books with examples, this is the book for you. <laughs> I don't know, but I got one star for that one. I was like, well, I think I did something. It's really awesome. It's very it's definitely You're endearing really yourself more and more than this whole weekend. So it's definitely really great because um, for, yeah, I know obviously a lot of people here have worked on shorts, but in the book, um, there's case studies not just from short films to feature films to documentaries and brought in some case studies like uh, the Zach Graff crowdfunding campaign and uh, Lily on the floors um, of a girl who walks home alone at night. There's a whole case study there about that. So I think uh, you guys are really enjoying it. The three case studies, just so you guys know, are all, I purposefully did this, even though people confuse crowdsourcing with crowdfunding, I purposefully picked three major case studies that involve an aspect of crowdfunding so that you can see, because they were successful because they took the three to six months of crowdsourcing in before they ever launched the campaign. So one's a documentary that raised like $85,000 that in a million years you wouldn't think that, that would be possible. but. Uh, based on the subject matter and everything like that, but you know, they, they, they put that work in, I mean, for months and months and months ahead of time. So it'll give you a good idea about the, about the branding part as well. I, 
I'd just like to say that thank you for having me. My email's online, you can find me. Please, if you have, if you had a question that you weren't able to ask, uh, please send it to me. I'm happy to uh, know who you are. Yeah, same here. I, you can connect me. Obviously, uh, if you're on Stage 32, you'll see my mug immediately when you sign up. Um, I answer all my DMs. I answer the first message you get is an automated message. Um, but everything after that, you respond to me, is me. Um, every single thing you supposed to in there is me. And if you want to follow us on well, social media, yeah, right? let me do that. Okay, okay. So no, I'll no, let you yeah, do that. Yeah. So this is one thing, so I want everybody to take their phone out. I know I'm making you do something. And what I'm going to have you guys do is I'm going to have you take a picture of the panelists. And hopefully, I mean, hopefully you've learned something from them today. You have to, you know, I just want to say to them, thank you for everything that they learned. And uh, so what I'm hoping you guys can do is take the photo. And then <laughs> take, the, take the photo. And then please post it on uh, Twitter. I'm going to give you their handles. Um, and, and Instagram. And Instagram. I'll give everybody the handles. Um, so if you're on Twitter, uh, Nick Terry's is at Nick. What is it? Nick? Nick. N-I-C-K-T-E-R-R-Y-M-G-N-T. Um, my mom always asks me what my plotter is. Oh, you do. <laughs> and then, well, RB's is easy. It's RB walks into a bar. <laughs> told you a lot yeah. of details. I'm um, both best. Can you get the judges to check? Is, it, is that yeah, what that's it is? Right, yeah. Thanks. Okay. All right. So if you guys could just thank them online. Um, you know, and again, that's part of paying it forward. You know, they spent the last two hours helping. They spent the last two hours, uh, you know, helping and give back their knowledge. So this is your way to pay it forward. Did you guys raise your phones again? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's such a cool picture. <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you. Got you. Thank you. Awesome, and uh, and we'll do that again for the next panel because again, like I said, we have some really really kick-ass ladies. We're gonna have fun on the next one. So, gentlemen, thank you so much for being thank here. You guys.